right. What's happening? Season two, episode seven. Bobby D presents Contrast Uncut. It's your host Zylo. Man, I got a very special guest. I got Mr. I'm from the Bay, Mr. Drip Trendsetter. I mean, Generation Now, A&R manager. He worked with the likes of Seti Hendrix, Jack Harlow, DJ Drama. I mean, you over there with the waves of the biggest waves of the sound right now. I got none other than Whoopi Joe, bro. What's happening? My boy, what's up with it, man? Shit, you know. Quarantine the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. Man, this is crazy. Just trying to wiggle, bruh. Shit, that's all. You know, technology helping me wiggle now. Definitely, definitely, definitely. I respect it, man. You know what I mean? Glad to have you on the show. Hell yeah, no. Nah, contrast Uncut appreciates you, man. You know, shit. You been fucking around with the fuck now. Shit. Hell yeah. I think the last time I ran into you was at the little BT thing, like four years ago. Damn, at the little, uh, I, you know, say, as soon as you said it, I remember the damn. Uh, right, actually, it was Kevin Gates performing and shit. Yep, yep, the little shit. Yep, I know exactly what you're talking about. Out in LA. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Shit, but man, every episode I start off with a quote, weigh in on how it relates to you, or if it don't, it's contrast and cut. Talk how you feel, man. So, uh-huh. some people want it to happen, some wish it would happen. Others make it happen. Michael Jordan. Man, uh, the way that the, the first thing stick out to me about the quote is some make it happen. And I'm definitely under the make it happen category. I feel like coming from, from the Bay Area, a lot of us is, is, is blessed to add that in our, in our veins. Fresh out the gate, like just having to make it happen attitude. I feel like that's one of the great things about the room. Cause we would learn, we would talk early to, you know, make nothing into something. So, you know what I mean? That's definitely what stick out to me about the quote. Hell yeah. We understand it ain't nothing for us but to get it. And you got to find your way to get it. Facts. You'd be surprised how many people don't really get that. Real talk. They really, do. they really think it's supposed to be other people to do it for them. Just find the right person to do it for you and you got it. They in for a rude awakening, boy. For real. Ain't no one gonna put nothing into you unless you put stuff into yourself. Exactly. If you ain't got no value in yourself, how you gonna expect other people to put value into you? That's fucked off business. Facts. Facts. It's just, it's just mind blowing how many people don't get that off common sense, but you know what I mean? <laughs> Man, they don't even know the terminology of the shit they asking for. <laughs> <laughs> Facts, bro. Like they don't even know what they're really asking somebody to do. Like that's just crazy. Man, I be man, but you know that's that's part why I appreciate educating people. But sometimes you could tell them something, it go over their head, and they think they got a haircut, and that's it. Exactly. Exactly. You know, but one thing I peeped is the majority of people it takes for them to experience and then go wrong for them to get what somebody told them previously, you know. But you know, I was always taught, you know, uh, a person that a person that, that learns from somebody else's mistake is a smart man, a nigga that learned from his own mistakes is a fool. So, you know what I mean? I try not to, you know, even though I, I'm, I'm a fool, because I definitely learned from my own mistakes, but if you come after me and I'm able to give you that game where people go, Man, that's deep, bro. That's almost like you a base runner most of the time. They are the ball. They don't put you up there. All you gotta do is get around these bases and come home, collect the two hundred. Yeah. <laughs> Back. Something to run slow. All type of shit. When you're supposed to be running hard and fast. <laughs> shit. Facts. Man, beast mode ain't come from nowhere, you hear me? <laughs> yeah. So, bro, I got to get into my segment, man. It's, it's, did the game choose you or did you choose the game? And essentially, it's my origin question. I want to know when you first started rapping and, and how, it, how it became, how you became the drip. Nah, definitely. Um, well, it, it's kind of crazy because just on my overall 
life or career story, it's both. You know what I mean? Because as a youngster, I chose the game. Because once I saw Mac Maul, the legal business, and once I seen, you know, I, I'm from the kills of Vallejo, so, you know, E40, Mr. Flamboyant was the first CD I ever had, period. And then, uh, then I got discovered cable, and then I saw Snoop Dogg with Doggy Style, and that, that really did it right there. Like that was like, oh shit, I, this is what I really want to do. So from that point on, you know, I, I, I've been an artist, I've been rapping, I've been you know moving around. Like, um, like I said, I'm from Vallejo, California. You know, I've, I've been I'm a typical nigga that always wanted to rap, and everybody wanted to be this and that. I was always the one that was the rapper. I was always in the town show doing some shit. Um, it, it wasn't until I moved to Atlanta though. Until I like, so it became a serious thing because uh, moving to Atlanta was the first time I really was truly on my own. Like, and it was like first three years out of high school, I was moving around in the Bay, but I didn't really have like no career per se. I was just a person that rapped good, that knew how to, you know, pay for studio time and sell CDs around my school and shit like that. So it never was really a big deal until like, you know, right before I moved, I got with my cousin, uh, Don P. You know, he, uh, he he pretty much, you know, introduced me to my first studio, professional studio, that is. And, you know, and I started getting my feet wet on his CDs and stuff like that. And then shortly after that, I moved to Atlanta because my sister was going to Clark. And uh, she used to always put me on, like, man, the South would be big. This is before Atlanta was Atlanta. Like, the South had to be big. She used to send me T.I. first CD, Laugh Attack, all that shit. And I used to be like, okay. So I pretty much just went out there. She was she she was staying in the dorm. I used to sneak in the dorm to sleep at night, just try to figure the shit out. I got a job at the airport, mm. and then and then I started getting some money. And then like, cause I, I moved to Atlanta with ten dollars, one mixtape, and and it's a dream. Like so, when I got the job, I finally was able to press up the mixtape I recorded when I when I came. So I pressed that. Up. I started listening to the radio, like where shit was at. Mind you, I'm in Atlanta, I don't know nobody but my sister. So that's the reason I was taking these tactics because I didn't have nobody to call and be like, hey, what do you know where the show at or where this at or the studio at? I had to find out on my own. So on the radio, I heard somebody on the radio like, oh yeah, the show going down at this club. I got a ride to the club. I stood outside because I couldn't afford to go in. Handed people my CD as they came out. One of the persons I happened to hand it to was a nigga that, you know, that was in the Atlanta scene. His name was uh, Fort Knox and big, two people actually, big time. Called me three days later, like, man, I heard your CD, bro, you, you gas and you do your thing. So start building with them. They pretty much introduced me to the open mic showcase scene. Like, Cause you know, coming from the Bay Area or even from Vallejo, like I wasn't used, I never heard of it. I never heard of like just open mics and, and fucking. <laughs> it was only in Berkeley and we yeah, exactly. across the bridge. Yeah, if you wasn't over there, you ain't hearing nothing. Leo, none of that. So I was like, what the fuck, word? You ain't got to be in school to have a talent show. Like, that shit blew me. So when I started doing that shit, I started building momentum with that shit. Then I kind of created a song called Get Em, Got Em. Uh, I did it at the showcase. I actually performed at TI Club, Crucial. I performed that shit. Jazzy Faye happened to be in the audience. Um, Body me over the next day. I got signed to showing up Capital, but that was around the time where every, uh, Sierra had goodies out. They had a goose named Cherish. They had uh, Lloyd. He had the he had the U song with Lil Wayne, and uh, and they also had uh, my boy Jody Bree. So I was a new artist on his new, on this label, like traveling, seeing these niggas go crazy. So Lloyd going crazy. I'm like I'm, I'm up under him. I'm, so it's my first time like just being outside of my comfort zone, really getting the game. From the industry side, but it was six months later, show enough broke up, and I just was on Capitol. The person who signed me to Capitol was Ronnie Johnson. He died in his sleep six months later. What's crazy about Ronnie Johnson is he signed me and Clyde Carson at the same time. Because Clyde Carson was with Black Wall Street with Game, and I was with Show Enough. And he was like, Man, I see y'all being the future of the Bay, so I'm gonna, you know, he signed us to Capitol. And you know, he, he just he happened to pass away. And what made that crazy, you know, me and me and Clyde went to school together in high school. So we seen each other grind from day one. Like, you know what I mean? So that was a, like a cool moment to, that we thought really just happened. So when homie died, that's just like the cheerleader coming out the building. You know what I mean? And nobody was like cheering for you. So I was kind of stuck on the label for like two years and trying to get the lawyer to get me out of it. So I just made a conscious decision. Like, you know what? You know, I'm, I got buzz out here and shit moving. But the main thing that was missing from my whole shit is like the Bay Area. 
back on me, like, because I was a Bay Area artist. Like, I was out there high see, I'm telling you, I'm from Bay. Like, I wasn't trying to be no Atlanta nigga. You feel me? Everything. I wasn't trying to be no Atlanta nigga, nothing. But then when the labels would call, because I had Atlanta so popping, I, you know, like bidding wars and shit. But so when I looked so when the labels would call the Bay Area, Big Vine, DJ Amen and shit like that, they'd be like, yeah, I know him personally, but he ain't got no way. You know what I'm saying? And which was true. It wasn't hating. It was honest truth. I didn't have a way because I came, I went straight to Atlanta right when I got grown. Like, you know what I mean? So I didn't establish myself like with the, you know what I mean? Like, even though I knew Jack, uh, Mr. Fab, Clyde Carson, like all these people were perfect jerk, all these people were my friends, but I wasn't a part of that circle per se. You know what I mean? So, like, the consumers and the people that buy the music of the bank wasn't knowing about me, they was knowing about them. But yeah, see, it's funny, I want to say it's funny, it's interesting, bro, because you said you was hustling CDs in high school and you went to high school with Clyde. And, yeah. you know, the history of the team is that they used to go on gas station runs and really move units. And yeah, that was, you had the same influence, he took it to Atlanta and they didn't know who he was, but Atlanta knew who he was. And that's like the, the Southern Mecca, damn near, like, you feel me? It's up there with New York, like. <laughs> Man, exactly. And because what's crazy about you saying that is like, I was like, me and Clyde joke about it all the time, but I was like the fourth member of the team, if you will. Like, the whole grind at the gas station was from them seeing us do that in high school. I was uh, in, in 12th grade, Clyde asked me to, you know, you know, how to make a hook. Like, you know what I'm saying? So just, so imagine coming up with, with somebody and y'all, y'all work out everything together, y'all kind of like bounce off each other's styles. I go to Atlanta. He stays in the bay. I come to visit. This is before I sign, though. I come in, I come to visit like a year later. Hot to hear the hottest song in the in the bay, but it sound like me. <laughs> so people are telling me I sound like Clyde, but don't know our, our history. But me being a real nigga, it's not my place to really. Be, 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 be. It is what it is. So, but that was crazy because that just gave me real motivation. So when I went back to Atlanta, that's I got signed shortly after that because I was like, oh, fuck that. But, but yeah, that was great. So basically, after um, being uh, you know, two perfect people dying, I'm stuck on the label. I moved to the Bay Area. Basically, I moved back home. Like, you know what? Fuck all this shit. I dropped the management I had. I'm just go to the bay and just do the shit on my own. And it's like 2010. Um, uh, around this time, you know, this is a couple of years after the hot years. Club, so around this time, the Bay Area rap, the Bay Area scene as far as on the radio, the hype movement had died. Right. Like, you know, they, they done fucked all the clubs up. There's no more hella shit from clothes. So it's like, I came at a time where the scene was dying down a little bit. And, but I still was off the high of me repping it from afar, you know what I mean? So I, I still can't do so. When I came, the first thing I thought, because you know, I've always been a student of the game. And I always like, I like to, I like to strategically plan stuff. And like, that's just the way I do things. And when I came back to the Bay, I'm like, you know what? I can't just come right out and be like, hey, I'm a Bay nigga coming out with a song. It, you know, it probably don't get no love. So I, I figured like, at the time I was a fan of Slaughterhouse. So I was like, you know what? I'm friends with Earth the Jerk and I'm friends with Tracks a Million. Like, got at them, like, I started recording with them, like, man, we should get together. They was hanging with my boy, that's my boy now, Neo the Gift. And then we all kind of was recording at the same place in Richmond, my boy Kev House. And then I was like, you know what? I said, we need to come out with like a, a like a power group little project, like, you know what I mean? Call the shit fly, nigga, move it. At this time, niggas wasn't on no fly shit, bro. I don't give a fuck nobody to say, nigga. The whole Jay-Z button up, all that type of shit, like, that was around that time. And we was frowning on that. We still was baggy shirts, baggy, you know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, shit. Jay-Z was I on got the with them was niggas. We started. Exactly. Pico to me and Black and Miles. So, we like, so when I got, with, when we created the Fly Nigga Movement shit, we started, you know, wearing our clothes a little more fitted, doing, doing certain shit, talking about being fly, like, bringing that to the music. And people just gravitated because Irk already had a fan base, Tracks had a fan base. I had a fan base from Atlanta and Leo had a fan base. So us bringing it together, just announcing that we was together, automatically put me already in a position where I didn't have to start over in the bay. Like I was I was put right think right there by being associated with them and doing something with them. So You already validated. Huh? You already validated. Yeah, exactly. So because and, and, and if anybody questioned it, they was there to 
to, to, to shut it down because they knew about all the shit I did in Atlanta. They knew you know, the so history. They knew the history, so that's what made it like official. So like one of the first things I did when I came to look to the bay was I I did a song with Jack, the Jacker because my late shit. We did a song a million, me, him, and Big Rich, like one of my favorite songs I ever recorded. Like so, that kind of started it off. Jet, oh, we used to be over there in Hertz and then in Hayward, and uh, so basically we got together and started working on the song. We got a call from Big Von. Big Von was like, "I want y'all, I want to interview y'all to announce the group, bring three songs." We only had two songs recorded though, as a group though. So Earth just recorded a song. And was like, man, what y'all think about this? Like, he's like, he ain't say what you think about this to play. He just said, this is a new song I work with. This is gonna be my solo song on the project. And the song happened to be right here. Like, you know what I mean? So when I heard the song, I was like, that needs to be the third song to play. Like, I don't give a fuck if it's all of us or not. Like, that shit a hit. Nigga, I'm kid you not. Big Bomb played that shit on our interview and never stopped playing. And right here, it became the biggest song in the Bay Area at that time. Right. You know, and, and, and Earth the Jerk becomes Earth the Jerk as far as uh, you know, as far as California goes, shit like that. So, so when that happened, so obviously by him, before the group even had a chance to even really get out there, Earth blows up. So you gotta kind of respect that. I mean, cause shit, we ain't we didn't grow up together. Like the, our goals was to be solo artists. You know what I mean? So for a song to crack for him, it was like you know what, you know like. You know, you gotta let it fade away. You gotta let him do what he do. Like, you just support him. You, you continue your solo grind. So that's the group kind of faded away. And, you know, obviously, it Earth. became Earth. And then after that, I kind of, that's when I started getting my confidence to really go crazy with the solo shit. Then I, right after that, I created a song called Monte Ellis. Well, that's when that's really good. That's when he was on the Warriors. And I, I was living in San Jose at that time. So I, I, I had, like, my approach was the same thing I did in Atlanta, was get a side of town on me. That's not where I'm from, because I already got Vallejo. Like, you know what I mean? So, but if I get San Jose at the time, nobody talking about San Jose. Nobody talking about San Jose. The only people talking about San Jose is my friend, my pimp time. My niggas that's telling me about here. And then, basically, my best, my close friend, my boy Mar, my boy uh, Ken, they bought Club Wet. And once they bought Club Wet, I kind of stationed myself in San Jose. And then I dropped the song Monte Ellis. We played in Club Wet every weekend. And, you know, the whole bay was coming because it was a new club. And so every whole bay was going out there, motherfucker, and shit started buzzing. Till one day, Monte Ellis was there. And they played shit. And then the nigga was fucking with it. Then he got traded right after that. got <laughs> 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 traded. That, that, that kind of faded away. And then... And then you gotta yeah, reinvent like, yourself. Crazy, bro. Because uh, you gotta reinvent yourself, too. Bro, I think you probably reinvented yourself five, six different times. Yeah, for real, for real. And right after my story. Said, story. Huh? I said not to fast forward your story, but man, you definitely have reinvented yourself and made yourself less last the test of time. You're making yourself timeless through all these transitions. No, nah, definitely. And so after that, basically we got together and my company, even when I was on the on show no capital, I had my own label then. It was Waterboy at the time, so like I kind of already always been in the entrepreneur space. So, but when we did the Monte Ellis shit and that kind of faded away, then I just started like you know making songs and stuff like that. So basically, when I came to Atlanta, I uh, I got with one of the Bay Area producers that was out here. I came to visit, so I went to A Three C Festival or whatever, and my boy was chilling. And pretty much, we just had a one one session the whole time I was there. Only had one session. A nigga from the Bay came through. He played some beats. I saw a beat that said, I'm from the East, bro. And I was like, what the fuck is that? He was like, nah, that ain't, he ain't gonna fuck with that. I said, nah, play that. He played it. The first thing I said is, I'm from the Bay, bro. And mm -hmm. as soon as I said that, I said, everybody in the room went crazy. That's it, nigga, that's it. We need to record that right now. So I did hook, did all that shit. And then basically, when I came back, that was like 2012, whatever. I just said, you know what? I want to reinvent my whole company. Because I was waterboy for a minute. And I was like, man, what can be a twist from waterboard? And then my boy, Say Sanchez, was like, what about drip? Like, drip symbolized water, too. I'm like, you know what? Drip Squad, like, that's hard. And we got a logo, did the whole shit, like, created the company Drip Squad Worldwide. And uh, then I put out Babra. I put it out with Fizzler, actually. And this is when Fizzler was, like, a one-year company. He was just he was just a white boy that was just talented. Mm -hmm. and shit off the ground. And, you know, I was telling him, like, I told the nigga to throw his first show. He threw his first show. It was with Fly Nigga Movement, San Quinn, and I think Roach Gig. It was in the spot in Berkeley. 
So basically, ever since then, we had a relationship. So me and him got together for the Bay Brush shit. I saw, I went to the Macklemore concert with my boy Ken. He saw E40 backstage. The Macklemore brought out E40. And I knew Macklemore, he was my Seattle partner. So I highly requested, nigga, I got the song. Cause me, I always told him we need to work, but you know how rappers do, we need to work. I, like, but we, I never had nothing. But then when I seen him, I knew exactly what the fuck had to happen. I said, no, you gotta get a new song. He's like, send it, it's good. Exactly. So when I sent it to him, you know, thank God for our Vallejo ties and all that shit. Knocked that bitch right out, sent it right back. And then I, it was crazy. And Bay Bro was, Bay Bro was born and then fucking the drift squad was on the whole drip. And then basically, you know, Bay Bro is pretty much the song that gave me what I was looking for in the Bay Area. Like I was looking for that, you know, just that, yeah, I'm here. Like, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm, I'm just as official as any other artist. Like I'm, I'm, I'm playing big boy ball, like an official rapper. Put on for you the know. Yeah, and doing it for the bay, and, and that song just pretty much did that for me. Like it pretty much put me in the light of, you know what I mean? Y'all, y'all need to pay attention to bro too. And, and then from there, you know, so doing the drip shit, bay, bro, did the bay, bro, remix with everybody from the bay on that motherfucker. And then probably two years after that, the word drip just becomes so famous and so big, like, and it's crazy because this is, as you see, this is a pattern in my life where I would do something first or I would put somebody on, my humble personality don't talk about it, and then it happens somewhere else, and then it comes back to me like I'm biting that. When I did it, when it wasn't even, nobody was even thinking about it. Like, you know what I mean? So. Ahead of your time. That'd be that. Yeah, exactly. But I had to learn. I had to learn, though. I had to learn a lesson out of that. Stuff. I used to be bothered by that shit. I had like a little chip on my shoulder about that shit. Like, man, niggas don't respect me like they need to do, but I had to realize that. Because especially what I'm doing now, like, it's because I was here to be on a purpose. I was here to do it a certain type of way. You feel me? And get down a certain type of way. So them was really blessings and really shit that was training me to be the thing I am today. Hey, but before you get to today, I got to bring up another group that you was a part of and it ended up not working out. And then they ended up becoming solo artists. And, you know, they're very successful. The story, yeah. Second letter. Yeah, my brothers, man. And what's crazy about that is it's, it's the same shit. It's fucking climbing the movement shit I just explained. Like, I, know. I knew Cousin Feet. I knew Cousin Feet because me and him always been, you know, black rappers that support each other. So we've been known each other for years, just supporting each other, and shit like that. He always been supporting. Fucking, I did, a, I did a feature for him. I seen him at the barbershop and he was like, you know, I, you know, I got a young boy, uh, Neff on, this song, on that song that we did. I was like, for real? Because I knew Neff. Cause his mom used to work at the DMV in Vallejo, so she was like the DMV lady, always took niggas up, and, you know, getting these packs and shit like that. So I remember I met Neff when he was like 15 years old. She was like, "Yeah, my son rap, you know, I mean, look out for him." Type of thing. He was like 15 at that time. I'm like, "Yeah, for sure, keep grinding, keep pushing." You know, I didn't, didn't really see him just giving encouragement and shit. And then fast forward, I the nigga say uh, he got on the song. This is before big timing though. So he got on the song, and then. Then I was like, oh, that's, and I listened to it. I'm like, this shit sounds good. And I'm like, bruh, and here come my little A&R idea. Hey, bruh, we should come together as a team and do a little powerhouse group. Like, cause this is like probably three, four years after the fly nigga movement shit. So I'm like, we go another chance to do it. We record two songs, three songs, E-40 here. And be like, man, I need to meet with y'all, nigga. It only makes sense 20 second later come out under me. We need to, we need to rock. We need to, cause feet are more already fine to me. Y'all two niggas need to come and woo woo. Mind you, I had a show at Ace of Spades. I was opening up for, um, I want to say YG. It was somebody. But I had, I brought Neff out. Like I was performing and I brought Neff out because we had the 707 song together with the fucking, uh, with 40. So I brought him out. Then we backstage, like they brought him out for song on Monday. And got the video and everything, and she gonna drop at the same time. Shit gonna go crazy. I'm like, for real, we here. It was big time. So I was like, this shit crazy. My nigga, like, for real. Nigga, that Monday, boy, that nigga dropped that shit. The whole thing's on fire in a week, nigga. It was like, what the fuck? Like, this is my second time just watching some of Like, it's really my third time. Because the other story I didn't say is when I first moved to Atlanta, the first artist I met that was under my wing, they was my engineer, and I showed him how to do hooks and shit, was BOB. Like, I gave him his name, B.O.B. I, I named him B.O.B. Uh, I showed him how to do hooks. I showed him how to do perform. 
Like, and so it's like, that's like this. And so that was the third time me watching somebody out of literally and mm-hmm. like, yeah, blow up right in front of my eyes. Like this, and that, and that's what, what's so crazy about these stories is it explains why where I'm at today. It's because I didn't realize I was being an a and from time to time. I didn't realize that I was being an ad the time where I'm seeing talent before anybody see it, pump confidence in them, do songs with them because that's my outlet. And then watch them just blossom and just become big. Like, you know what I mean? So, so obviously, 20 seconds later, that kind of faded away because, you know what I mean? That's how it goes. I mean, big time, it becomes the biggest song on the West Coast. And for one, he's busy. And then for two, uh, you know what I mean? Like, it don't really make sense to you to do a group album with some niggas you just met. When you met them, you're always on the same level. Now you're, you're past people. It's just, it is what it is. You know, now I can see it and look at it like that, but obviously at the time, at all. But, you know. Bruh, I'm actually like in the same boat as you where I've seen a lot of people blow up in front of me, people I've known, people I've like, you know, had conversations with and helped out and all type of aspects. And they put me in my position today where I A&R and besides being the show. And I'm also an assistant for Marvin Gaye the third. Like all the things yeah. that got to me in the should be where I'm at. Yeah, that's crazy how how life just fucking just guides you to where it needs you to be. Yeah, it wasn't meant for you to be the, the face of the bay and in, 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 in that way. I mean, you became the face of the bay. But that wasn't meant for your world. Like, bro, who you touch today, the artist you're a part of, bro, that's that's generation now for real. Man, I ain't never lie. I ain't never lie, man. That's real shit, man. Oh uh, man, I'm gonna go ahead and transition out of this, bro. Before you go ahead and, and, and light the backwood up, I gotta ask you something. Mm-hmm. This is for all yes, my guests. I ask all my guests this. When was the last time you pulled over? Last time what? Yeah, I know. I caught your ass. When was the last time you were pulled over? And the whole, before you get to thinking about you it, said like, I ain't trying to get you to snitch on man nothing, but the idea is that you I mean we still standing, we not sitting, we not knocked out, laid down six feet deep from dealing with the police. You did something right, and I'm just trying to get the awareness out there on you feel me the right shit that you did, and if something popped up, what could you have done different? Uh, as far as the last time, last time was really. Regular innocent shit like nigga. Oh, tell me, fuck. tell me the good shit. Fuck the innocent shit. Tell me the good shit. <laughs> uh, last time I got pulled over on that kind. I mean, you know, that shit used to happen so much back in the day. And one time I definitely know that I can talk about now is um, you remember Pink Diamonds in Frisco? Uh huh. Strip clubs, the little black strip club, and then it came down. Uh huh. Like so, basically, I was at the strip club with Irk. This is around the fly nigga movement time. I was at the strip club with Irk, and uh, we were just fucking around, you know, getting music played and shit. So a big fight break out. Bah, niggas start fighting. Blah blah blah. Cops come. They shooting outside. You know, there's a shooting and the cops shooting and shit like that. We, me and this nigga, run to the car. We run to the car to try to get out of there. As we go into the car, the cops stop us. Like we running because we just did it. So he like, oh, hold on, can I talk to you all about it? Me, I don't know that Earth got a strap in the car. Oh, wow. So when he stopped us and talked to us, he see the strap, he called the police, he called his, all his partners, his task force, niggas rush us, fucking throw us on the ground, handcuffs, nigga, me and Earth in the motherfucking, in the jail, like in the, in the holding cell, like together, like what the fuck going on? Like don't know what's going to happen. Basically, the nigga, he get let go, and they send me because I had a warrant I didn't know about, about this dumbass ticket or whatever it was for. So I'm, but I didn't tell me that though. They told when they tell me I gotta stay, he gotta go. I'm thinking all types of shit. The nigga snitching is a, am I being set up? Like, what the fuck? So I, I'm like, what the hell? So they send me up. Put me in a little call for some shit, transfer me to where the, where the one was at, which was happening in San Jose and shit. But basically, it, it, it was some shit I had to go through in order to just get that shit up off me. Like, as far as how it went down, I, I was fucked up. I didn't really have to go through that experience. But 
as far as like, you know, what was going on and and was kind of on my record and not known, I pretty much had to face that so I can just be clean slate, basically. Hell yeah. What's one thing you feel like you could have did differently that night? Dealing with the um, police. Not nothing dealing with the strip club. I'm talking about dealing with the police. Really ain't nothing I think because because any if I did anything I did differently, what I did was just going against the code, it was going against the code that I believe in. So really not because the only thing I could do differently is be like, hey, that ain't my gun. Hey, that ain't this, that ain't that, that ain't that. And you know, that ain't really that solid in my book. You know what I mean? So it really ain't nothing I could have did different, really. But but not go to fucking strip club. In fucking Frisco when it's no real reason to. Like, he's just trying to be outside and be out. Like, nigga didn't have no real reason to go out and perform. So it, it showed me, I, I, like, you know, when you're starting to get buzzed, or if you if you got a big name, like, you just got to move. You got to move smart, basically. I feel it. Basically. So I'll be just trying to get the awareness out there for these youngsters that be wanting to make them extra decisions. And and don't understand what's at risk when you out there making them decisions, cause shit could happen fast. Exactly. So, I got a thing called trading places. It's like Freaking Friday, where I take two iconic people and we switch their lives and they wake up like that. And what my you know what I mean my two questions to you is one, would it work? And two, what would life be like each person like that? And today for you, bro, I got Jackie Robinson trading places with Tom Hanks. Okay. So that means Jackie Robinson. And the first question was what? Will it work? Um, being that nobody would know that it's a black person and a white person part of the body, and then vice versa, it definitely can work if the if the person brain make it work. As far as how going off how Jackie Robinson moved and became the first to serve shit and just how gifted he was. He seemed like he's smart enough to make it work. And Tom Hanks obviously showcased he's smart. So I think it definitely will work. And the other question is what? What would life be like if they woke up like that? You, it would be, be different. Actually, it'd be it would different. be different. It wouldn't be different at all, but it would be inside their bodies though. Like <laughs> being Jackie Robinson in a white man body, he really see how life really is on the other side. And but but it really affects Tom Hanks. Because he'll really see how it is on the other side. <laughs> and it'll really show Real nigga, talk. How you should appreciate or you know, every, even niggas different. Like you gotta appreciate everybody's story and everybody's journey. Man, Tom Hanks gonna be like coronavirus wasn't shit after he got done living. Man, hey, you feel me? What nothing after surrogation, nigga. What the fuck? You hear me? Real talk. That shit funny. So, bro, what I do is uh, I got a deck of cards. Actually, let me see the whole deck of cards, producer. So, pretty much what we do, bro, is uh, we randomly take three. My producer, he the voice off air or off the camera. Sometimes he come on the camera. It's up to him. But, uh, yeah, man. So, we take random cards. He already selected three for you. And the whole idea is impulse. What's your impulse answer? And they, they're random. They're good questions, though. So impulse questions, me right off my head? Yeah, impulse. Like, you feel me? First first impression. Okay. So don't be having a PR state of mind. You hear me? <laughs> All right, wow. First question. If you were reincarnated as a famous landmark, which would it be? Um, Lamb. The Bay Bridge. Mm. Now, would that be the one that just got built, or are you talking about the the original, the earthquake one? Uh, cause that that boy that lasted. Okay. Question number two: Who would you most like to sit next to on a ten-hour flight, and why? Um, it's not late. Uh. So I can talk to her about love and basketball and hopefully I can get in her brain so I can become Omar Epps in her life, you know what I mean? And get it right. You're gonna have to become Jay-Z because she don't know shit about basketball. 
<laughs> We're going to talk about the movie. It's all good. All right, question number three. Would you rather be the most popular in school or the smartest kid in school? Smartest kid, because I already was even one of the most popular and I didn't even know it. <laughs> <laughs> kid, stay your ass in school and be smart. But Thanks. then again, look at look at his story he tells. That shit's cool as fuck. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to go through it though, trust me. It's cool after afterwards. Yeah, yeah, but the process, bro, is the shit people don't understand. But, That's you know, true. I've been paying a lot of attention to Kobe Bryant's life, and something he always says, you got to love the process of where it's slow and it doesn't make sense and it's hard. Because once you figure it all out, everything's going to get easy and you won't go through those emotions anymore and you won't be motivated like that. Damn, that's real as fuck. Was that a book or something? A documentary? What was that song? <laughs> Bruh, you know, they be making all these Kobe YouTube tributes and when bruh passed away, I ain't gonna lie, bruh, I was watching all of it and soaking it. Like, I was watching movies, it felt like. Oh, yeah, I need to see some of that. That was some game right there. Real talk, but shit, man, what are you most excited for? What, you know? Uh, the future, bro. Just seeing where, you know, where this shit taking me. Because, you know, I tell people all the time, like, for the last two years, I did I did something I've never done in my whole existence of living, and that's get out of God's way and let him lead it. You know what I mean? Like, you know, I think that's why I'm so, because, you know, so funny is, like, I just went to the Bay probably, you know, before it's corona, shit, probably four or five weeks ago. Uh, said he had a, you know, he had a song with Neff and uh, with Neff, so we shot the video to Ryan Dubele. But I just, we had went to a party. We had, they had a whole, he had a party he was hosting and shit. But I was just tripping out on this like, DJ, the people coming up to me like they still talking to me about like as me as the rapper and not as the A and R and manager. And it was just like tripping me out because niggas, man, you don't miss this shit, bro. You just do one more, blah blah. And it's just funny that, like, when they telling me that, like, I don't have no burden at all. Like, nah, and I, and I even look at them like, you, you really don't understand. Like, you, when you transition, you transition. Like, I'm saying, when, when God moves the next chapter, you have to allow it. Like, so that, it just tripped me out how here I'm just paying our manager and where I go and then go to the base, still people that be, be on the other shit. So, man, what is it like traveling with with Seti and Jack Harlow? And because you know Jack Harlow, he like me, man. <laughs> yeah, it's it's pretty. It's lit. Like you know, one thing definitely showed me I'm I'm big, bro. I'm OG around this motherfucker because there's some young ass niggas that's fucking living life. You know what I mean? Seti 24, Jack 21. So. You know, they, they're definitely young. Um, but it's also dope, uh, Kuma Chow, Fuminati too. You know what I mean? uh, she is an artist on the generation now too. Uh, it, it's dope, but it's, you know, it's just dope to see this, the new generation, the next generation. And what's even dope is like, just like my stories about, you know, seeing Ness before he, before he popped and seeing B.O.B. and seeing Clyde and seeing Irk and, and, and shit like that. You know, I'm 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 witnessing it still to this day. You feel me? We'll see Eaton Seti two weeks out of jail, and 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 never heard him rap a day in my life. But invited him to the writing session just off the spirit, and we built from there. And and even the song Low Key he got the hit record he got right now. Like we made that before he got signed. Like me and him did, I did two months building with him before I even introduced him to the label. Like just making sure his mind right and everything right. Like you know, as soon as I introduced him, he was signed. You know, the next day. Like, and now we rocking how we rocking, you feel me? Same thing with Jack, meeting Jack for the first time, I remember. He got signed the same time, around the same time I got hired. So, like, you know, I was a part of the whole, them trying to decide who they're gonna sign after Uzi, because, you know, Uzi's still on Generation Now, but they had they, they had their friction or whatever at first. You know, now it's getting better, but they was, they, their big thing was just trying to, you know, who would be the new artist that they were signed. So we know there was a lot of people on the table. But Jack was one of them, and you know, and along with uh, uh, my colleagues, that like, we all felt strong. Like he, uh, he got it. You know what I'm saying? And then just to see him three projects later, finally, you know, it finally clicking to the world. Like it's just dope to see. You know what I mean? And dope to see that shit get built right in front of my eyes. Hell yeah! Now that low key single is dope. 
I was like, I, I wonder what they had to go through to get the clearance on that, but man, it's that's awesome. crazy. So they got Everybody it. Say that. Everybody say that, but it's, that was like one of the easiest. Like right now, he got a project that's gonna drop, and we waiting for a certain song to get cleared, and that's take it's that taking a minute, but SWV came right through it when we had to get that cleared. So you know, things happen for blessing, and we got a, re, a remix gonna happen. That's gonna, that's gonna be crazy. So. Like I said, he's definitely working. He got a new project to drop. Uh, you know, Jack just dropped his. So we all just trying to keep this shit lit out here. Before I close out, I always ask my guests this, and you know, it's something unique. You feel me? The show's unique as it is. You're... What's that? You got any questions for me? No, nah, definitely. Uh, Because... I, I definitely seen you uh, trans, transition transition myself from just from you know from the from the little history we we definitely got. Uh, what's up, boy? What uh what things that you um, when you looking to work with people like how you say you, the system from Marv Gay work for other other shit? What what make you decide to even work with people? Trina? Bro, I'm always the music is medicine and shit. I'm trying to be a part of the manufacturing of it. Nah, we a dope, dope, dope energy though, man. And uh, definitely appreciate it, man. Is it? Oh, bro, where can they follow you at? Where can they reach you? Uh, at Willie Joe Drip on Instagram. I mean, that's pretty much what I be on. So at Willie Joe Drip, and you can also follow. Uh, uh, the, the fly in our space, and you know what I mean? You know, all your game information to keep up with shit, and you know what I mean? And uh, shout out to, you know, everybody I'm, I'm working with, man. Like I said, Steady Hendrix, definitely new project, definitely on the way. Jack Harlow out now. Louis Bird out now. DJ Drama Project on the way. Uh, we got a new artist, Hot Boy Jody, 8 to 4L, he dropping on. Third, we got ESTG. I don't feel nothing. He out right now, out of Louisville, Kentucky. Um, oh, me and my boy Ken, we just started our managing JT the Fourth throughout the Bay Area. So we got a crazy project that's coming, you know, under under our thing. You know, he not on sick with it no more, but it's still love. Forty on the album. So we, I mean, we got we got his next chapter popping, and uh, we just gonna keep it. We just gonna keep it lit, man. Shout out to Don G too for this. But let's keep it lit. Hey, yeah, bro. Let's get it, bro. I appreciate your time, bro. I appreciate you telling your story, bro, and coming on the show, man. It's been an honor and a pleasure, man. And we're going to keep on working. My boy, my boy. I appreciate you, man. You already know. Oh, yeah. Good luck. You got me reminiscing over you. I had that one G regulate. Mind playing tricks on me. Ghetto boys, better days. Jump around, house of pain. Mama said, knock you out. Double L, cool J. Time still ticking, though. Big clock, flavor flame. That's a public enemy. They see me coming up. I be verse, I'm going flip. Most squad, bust a bust. Feel like pocket, keep your head up. Biggie shooting juicy. Coach is still alive. Just let me prove. King, nigga. Everything.